I'm Jason, I'm an independent designer from St. Louis. Uh, for the most part, I design analog games about uh, spoken word and the written word, about how those things often have difficulty with conveying what you actually mean in your head. Uh, in the fall, I'll actually be pursuing a, a master's education and trying to explore those ideas a little bit more, not only digitally, but also in the analog space. Uh, and more relevantly, of course, to this talk, I'm a former competitive fighting game player uh, in Smash Brothers Melee, Super Sm uh, Street Fighter 4 and 5, um, and it's those experiences from those games that um, inform a lot of my study and particularly this presentation today. Uh, so I'm going to talk about what I consider the most misunderstood fighting game genre, or video game genre, sorry, um, and that's fighting games over here. Uh, I'm going to try and go over their history, their design, and then the actual play of them uh, to show how that name has betrayed a bit fundamentally more free understanding of them as games of intimacy. Uh, in doing so, I hope to really illustrate that there's a truth here that applies not only to fighting games, but also how we act as players across all game genres beyond just fighting games. Uh, so, what exactly is this about intimate design? And I could leave you with this simple adage that like fighting game design is intimate design, and let you figure it out, uh, that wouldn't really help you. Uh, I think intimate design is for the design for the purpose of players getting to know one another. This can be on a physical level in many cases. Uh, in, there's a game known as Consentical, which is a game about learning the, the body of the other person. Uh, it's not something that I'll go over here. If you're curious about it, I can talk about it more. Uh, but the body becomes a way for people to play and communicate with one another uh, in that game where you're not actually allowed to speak, so you end up engaging in this sort of physical charades. Uh, or it can be emotional and mental, where the players are playing to know one another. It can be a mixture of any two of these things. Uh, but fundamentally, I think intimate game design is designing games so that peels, players feel that they're knowing more about one another, having played the games, regardless of whichever emotional or physical access that might be on. Uh, Intimate design is thus a description of how players are playing the game. So it's a description of the meta strategy. Um, the necessary part of the strategy that you're going to be employing when you play a game like this is something that, uh, in order to win, you do have to know who you're playing against and you have to know who they are better than before, but not necessarily describing how that knowledge is gained. So that can really basically be understood in, in something in the art of war, <laughs> which is you know, to know your enemy, know yourself, and to know them, know them better than, than who they are. Um, so you can talk to one another if you actually want to get to know another person, and that's what initial friendships are like, but to actually see them perform their philosophies and their ideas, those, uh, see those expressions made manifest, that's something that I think games have a particular power to capture. And I'm sure many people have that experience of communal play and shared moments linking them together. Uh, in a game designed for intimacy, players engage in conversation through play faster than a spoken word can allow in a conversation at the speed of play, um, at the speed of action. Uh, play is the means of the mental connection in this context. Uh, fighting games design, I think, represents this ever-rising pinnacle of how strict systems design can actually capture a lot of these intimate emotions and ideas. It seems strange to say at first, I admit, uh, that fighting games are these intimate things. Uh, the word is loaded, um, for one. It's suggestive of a lot of things that usually happen behind the veil or behind a closed door. Uh, but that intimacy is really the only word to describe the feeling of when you are trying to make a play for the other, <coughs> excuse me, for the other person's position. So you're trying to dodge in a way that they will not expect or to place a move they will not see or to place a perfect counter to something that they're about to do. Uh, and if you are going to do that, to make a prediction about them, a meaningful and accurate prediction about them, how can that be called anything but intimate knowledge? So in fighting games, we call this yomi. Um, it's reading, the direct translation is the Japanese for reading the mind of the opponent. We see this idea represented in many disciplines, uh, not just fighting games like chess, go, poker, and analog games are all about predicting what another person might be doing or what they could have uh, in the back of their mind. Boxing, fencing, wrestling, uh, in the combat sports, and then something like the baseball pitch and return, batting, uh, tennis, volleyball, these are all things where you're trying to predict and understand how somebody's going to be moving and how that might be uh, reflected in your own play. But there's one key one that I think everybody really understands, and it's this one. Everybody understands this game. Uh, now, Rock, Paper, Scissors is not really a game that can be designed called Intimate on its own. Uh, I think they're 
the basic rules, the idea that you play rock, paper, or scissors to another person, uh, and then whoever wins according to this wheel is correct, suggests that you can really just play this surely randomly, and there's no reason to, to ever apply a strategy of like getting to know the other person. Um, but going back to that idea of these are the ways that we actually engage in the strategies, when you are playing against somebody for an extended period of time, say in a competitive setting, you're actually going to be playing to a best of three scenario. So what that means is that you can now engage in like vocal strategy. So if I'm going to play against, do you mind if I use you as an example? Uh, like, sure. So I'm going to play rock three times in a row, all right, for this, the purposes of this demonstration, right? And then you just play against me in rock, paper, scissors. And we'll go on one, two, three, rock, paper, scissors, shoot. And then on shoot, we'll go, all right? Ready? Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. And I literally just straight up told him what I was going to be doing. Uh, like, if I were to play against every single person in this room, against those same options, right? I'll go rock three times. And you all do whatever it is that you want to do to, to win against me. All right, ready? <laughs> okay. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. And now I beat a whole room, basically. <laughs> Half of it, anyway. Like <laughs> Uh, and I'm also a liar. Uh, but now that means you at least know something a bit about myself, and I potentially know something about this half of the room. Uh, I think some of you played rock, at least, from what I saw. Uh, but quite a few of you did still continue to play paper. And if we were to go into that last one, now we have an understanding that, like, okay, even though this person engages in that thought of, I'm going to play rock three times, and I'm going to try and counter that, those interactions intermix in your understanding of how you're going to play and how you're going to understand that next final move, um, which we can do, but I don't know how that's really going to play out, and <laughs> I, my script did not go that far. Uh, <laughs> so that's essentially how Rock, Paper, Scissors itself can function as an intimacy game. As I said, it's not necessarily a description of what happens in the rules themselves, but really a description, a meta description of the strategies in the meta game that happens afterwards. Uh, let's see. Sorry, going through my notes. Uh, right, and so we designed these systems for players to be meta gamed in that specific way. Um, that's us designing as, as game designers a way for players to project themselves into the play options that they do have. Uh, I had a stated intention, and your trust in that intention either paid off or didn't. Uh, but I think that's the reality of designing intima intimacy games, uh, especially fighting games. These are not games that have or contain any of our personalities in them to start. They're inert uh, in their unplayed state. This is our engagement that really gets us into them and how that you can then see the, the players themselves expressed through those actions. And that process is how that Yomi and how that reading is gained. So if Rock, Paper, Scissors can do all of that from a simple best of three rule set, why do we need fighting games at all? Like, if this is really all we need. Um, <laughs> uh, and especially when fighting games have this reputation as being complex, difficult to control, demanding beasts of game, right? Um, for instance, you may see a moveset like this, which is not that complicated, um, but then to actually perform like an extended combo of some sort in a game like Tekken, uh, it starts looking like this. And that's not something that everybody can readily spend the time to, to learn or manage. Uh, so what exactly are we doing here with these things uh, and all these different options? And I want to suggest to you that the answer is that all these things in front of you are really what fighting games have been doing to expand what rock, paper, scissors are. Uh, and from their origination, really that's kind of how they started. Uh, Originating in like the middle 1980s, one-on-one uh, -on -one fighting games have a history of like being one of the longest running formulated genres of, that we play today. Uh, there's certainly not nearly as many that have kind of crystallized in their form that early on in their development life in terms of like popular understanding. Uh, and so this one here, Karate Champ, uh, used two joysticks to allow people to pick out different options for how to move and, not, and also how to attack. And so that gave them something in the neighborhood of uh, that's 16, I believe, if my math is correct. Yeah, uh, 16 different options for any, uh, for any particular time in the game. Uh, a year later, the way of the exploding fist would incorporate um, a button into the mix along with a single joystick. Uh, so it's actually still the same. 
because they still only had 16 options with or without the button pressed. And it's these early fighting games that are slowly expanding what it means to play rock, paper, scissors with one another. If you have only three options, that's one thing. If you have 16, that's another. And that palette gets bigger and bigger over time. Five years later, we would get this game. Uh, Street Fighter II ultimately laid the foundation for basically every single fighting game that has come since. And ultimately, I think this is the form that the, the intimacy game has kind of taken uh, at the same time. And the key features of Street Fighter are are, are mixed, and not all of them came just from Street Fighter, but certainly these were compiled in a way that uh, no other game had, had done before. Um, so for me, let's just quickly lay that out. There's the timers, health, round, expressive characters, and what I characterize as unified inputs. Uh, and from this foundation, we really have the modern fighting game. Uh, in this view, I think you could probably map just about any fighting game that exists today into this particular look. Uh, that timer, the way health counts down either at the top or the bottom in the case of Smash, uh, bounded, a boundary of sorts to control location, uh, two characters with a lot of expressive ideas about who they are. So in adding the timer, that's very similar to rock, paper, scissors, right? That's rock, paper, scissors, shoot, and there you go. That's the decisive point where the match does end and one of us is going to be the winner. Uh, health bars are a way of playing more than just one round, really, if you think about it, right? Every single time, if you're gonna be engaging in one of those options, you're gonna be doing another rock or another paper or another scissors. Uh, the rounds, obviously, I think are, yeah, they're part of that. Uh, that actual format that we were talking about, like why I could say I'm gonna play rock three times, well, this is that situation. If I'm gonna play in rounds, well, here's my expectation for playing exactly the same every single time. Uh, and these big expressive characters, I mean, these are letting you choose your style of rock, paper, scissors. Uh, if it's not, if you could play rock, paper, scissors against an entirely separate set of physical motions, that's essentially what picking a character is for, in that analogy. Uh, and despite all of that diversity, the game fundamentally features the same input system. In Street Fighter, that's one stick and six buttons. Uh, and so mastering this game becomes about to actually physically play it. You have to learn how to throw each of the different potential rock, paper, scissors options. And in reality, there's something like 50 of them, uh, give or take another 10, depending on what game you're actually playing. Uh, so with this type of foundation, what exactly has that given us? Uh, for better or for worse, we have a completely modern fighting game. And we have built the entire fighting game community off the back of this design. Uh, because it's shared across so many different games, a lot of people are able to transition from one game to the other. Uh, frequently, the major difficulty for most people is just learning that language. That unified input system is the thing that's actually causing the difficulty and actually learning how to play, because when they actually sit down to play the game with other people, they're still engaging in that same game of trying to understand one another. And if they have that skill built up, again, because it's a meta situation, not necessarily one that comes directly from the system, they're able to transfer those skills as players in between games, um, like specific games, rather than into genre to genre. Uh, and so, an international tournament, we are in Mandalay Bay now, like we're in Vegas, we've made it, we've hit the big time. Uh, how exactly is that happening, per se? Like, if we go back to the original Street Fighter design, it didn't start with this, um, really, we can go back to those systems and see exactly how that meta understanding exists particularly for Street Fighter II and not for these other games. Uh, because now 30 years later, uh, we're equipped with this fuller context because we know that this happens at the end of it. And so there is something that did cause this. Uh, and so we know that the fighting game is to be played to know the opponents. Like that's something that we've observed. So let's examine how that system really supports the player ability to get to know one another. And we'll tackle those five uh, different foundational systems in the reverse order. So starting with this, the, the input system. So because you know every physical option available to the other player, there's like an actual human limit of what they can do, uh, you inherently know what they can do as choices, like from a physiological standpoint, like you know what they can potentially do. Uh, 
if you want to get into a meta meta game situation, they can also throw it, I guess, <laughs> like if they were really angry. Uh, so that's for, like a rage quit scenario. And honestly, that's one of the most expression, expressive actions you can do in a game like that. Like if you throw your physical object, there's there's a an emotion associated with that and an understanding that you can build uh, based on, on of them of based on that. Uh, and so you know that they're going to be making these choices among many. And like the example before, you can see the result of them choosing rock, 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 literally by manifested in this device. Um, might not necessarily be this device in particular. It could be a DualShock 4 or any other controller that exists. Uh, but from that, then we understand previously all the characters in specific knowledge. Um, and that's how you get characters with special moves, right? Like there are certain options that they're allowed to pick that can cover some of yours on your wheel uh, and you have to be aware of that and so each game sort of builds up their own personality of how this player to player rock paper scissors character to character rock paper scissors relationship works as well as the player to player rock paper scissors options because if you're choosing one at a certain time the other person's choosing one at a different time how that actually interacts that's playing for intimacy um, and then we have the bigger systems at play, right? We have the rounds, which allow you to really go through and uh, give you multiple tries at understanding one another, and that's understanding uh, literally how they play, right? Uh, because there are so many options, as they choose them, it becomes meaningful what the options that they do choose and they consistently choose over the course of playing them. Uh, then there's the timer and the health, which I consider drama gauges, essentially. Uh, they are able to inform how close to a decisive decision they are. As in the case of rock, paper, scissors, shoot, we're going one, two, three, shoot, uh, to actually count down to exact decisiveness. But here you actually have not only the negotiated uh, conclusion time, which is in the health bar, but also the absolute one in the timer. Uh, and as a result of that, players have unified goals to achieve. Uh, because when you're playing this game, you do actually have the same exact goal in this framework. You narrow the scope of the reasoning and thinking behind each human being playing these games down to, I'm going to try and win over the other person based on the parameters of this system. And that understanding helps, under, helps put everything else that they're about to do afterwards into a proper framework. Because then every choice they do must feed into that goal in some way. And that helps you probably the most in understanding another human being. You know exactly what they want to do how is it that they're going to actually achieve that along the pathway? That's the thing that you're trying to understand over playing a fighting game. And all of that isn't necessarily special to fighting games necessarily. Uh, some or all of these are simultaneously true of many other competitive games. Uh, I think probably the master stroke in terms of what a fighting game has over something like League of Legends, which still has all of these things. There's a match timer, there's health, there's a a lot of expressive characters, right? There's a complex unified input system between all of them. But the major difference between something like this and something like Street Fighter uh, is that you're not viewing your own world as you are here. Uh, the system framework for both of the games, for genres like League of Legends and MOBAs and fighting games do represent a means of projecting yourself into that system because they have all those basic elements in play. There's one thing that I think is really missing from League of Legends and Call of Duties and StarCrafts compared to fighting games, and that is this camera. <laughs> this is what I call the spectator's camera. Um, like, this side projection is probably the most important thing about fighting games vis-a-vis -vis being intimacy, because this view uh, represents that there's no hidden view. Like, everything that you do is shared between you in terms of your world space. So your avatars, your movement, uh, every moment, movement you make, every action you take is in relation to each other. Like there's, everything you do is pulled by a player because like I said, that system is completely inert, right? It's only the actions of the players being represented on the screen and creating that moment to moment narrative that's actually the play and the expressions of the people playing them. Uh, you can't hide anything. You really can't from this camera. Like, that's why when you actually spectate this or people who are spectating this are like, that's a ridiculous play because being on that field and actually looking for stuff like that for like bunk calls and stuff is much harder. I mean, 
one would argue, why don't they just give the refs this camera? But that's that's a different argument. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so intentional, every action, intentional or not, is communicated directly to the screen, and that to me is the the major triumph of fighting games as intimacy games. The complete communication of actions, like the 100% relay from one person to the other by this game medium, and there's nothing missing. Because no matter what, you and the other person are sharing the exact same screen and the exact same worldview. Uh, and that also means that as spectators, we see the same information as players. In contrast to other competitive games, which in first person shooters and MOBA games, there's five unique worldviews at any particular time. Uh, fighting games can be processed as a single visual narrative because of the spectator camera. Uh, and that's also true of competitive sports. And this camera has allowed players and audience alike to join in on the, not the intimate game of trying to know the other players. Because as a spectator, you share that same visual world as the people playing the game. And if you have the knowledge of how those systems work, you can also then try and predict how people are going to be playing those games. Uh, the spectating and surprise audience has always played a part in any competitive game, especially their audiences on Twitch or in any sort of like stadium scenario, right? Like all the gas and the cheering. Uh, they're different from other competitive games in that they have figured out the spectators, spectating camera in a way that their co digital contemporaries have really yet to do. Um, and this camera lets audiences play, play along. Like when a player surprises one another, uh, when a player surprises another, they're more likely to also surprise the audience. Like, that leads to moments like this one, right? Uh, like, I'll play some of this. I have less time than I thought I did. So I was going to play a lot more of it. But I want to ask you to do, I'll just play the first of it, half of this, which is involving the moment that you're all literally thinking of. Uh, and what I want you to do instead is, based on those things that we talked about before, uh, really just focus on what one character is doing, understanding how each of those options and why they make that option uh, their particular choice as a player. Uh, I understand that like part of the challenge is not everybody here has played Third, Third Strike Street Fighter. I also do not play much of this game. Uh, but consider the fact that they sometimes they choose to move, sometimes they choose to move away, sometimes they choose to press a button, sometimes they don't press a button. Uh, how that all plays together is fundamentally the intimacy game. So try and pick just one of these people. Don't try and process the whole thing, just one of them. And I'll play, this is not the video, that one. And there's a lot more to this footage than, than before. Uh, I'm probably just gonna talk about the Ken because that's the important one for this one. Uh, like he's really trying to chase down. Like he understands that because of the characters that they've picked, uh, one of the characters has this, the character on the left right now has the option of being extremely dangerous at long range. Uh, and so his counter to that strategy is to never be there. Never ever s let that person play that particular rock option. And so that he, his version of positioning rock, paper, scissors is to be up close all the time as best as he can. And then when he's actually up close, well, what type of options do I take? And this character who just landed that huge attack has a move that can be landed very dangerously off of a very low commitment move. So it's like being able to throw two rocks at the same time whenever they pick one. It's like a Monty Hall problem. It's like, okay, I see that you're about to throw paper. I might want to change my mind from this rock. And they get to do that every single time. That doesn't sound fair, but that's what tier lists are. Like, <laughs> like that's a result of having imperfect like system design, right? Like we know it's not perfectly balanced, but at the same time, because the system is inert without human input anyway, what happens here is sort of a result of people having their own ideas about what will work and what will not work. Like, who's telling who that I'm gonna play rock three times in a row, uh, and who isn't? Like, who's willing to say that, oh, I think this person's gonna lie to me, and I'm gonna play scissors to when I think that they're about to play paper. And of course, if you're not familiar with this footage, um, <laughs> you, 
Yeah, it's very stressful to actually think about this from the perspective of this character here. Uh, And the reason why I bring up that starting example of Rock, Rock, Rock is because at this point, that's what the Chun-Li player, this character, is doing. Every motion they make starts to become, I'm going to play Rock. What was really powerful about this character and this player was that they recognized that call. They said, oh, you really are just going to do that, so I'm going to constantly play paper because that moment was actually not something that could be reacted to. Like, you might say, oh yeah, he parried the whole thing, which in the context of this game, you can't take what's called chip damage, and so you have to do something very precise in order to counter that damage. Uh, before this flash happens, you actually have to be already inputting that motion to counter this. So it was predicted. Like, this was not something he reacted to and then said, okay, now I'm gonna do it. Before this happened, before this this particular animation happens, he has to already be doing it. Um, which means it's a, it's a prediction, right? Like, he made the call out, he saw, you're gonna throw rock a bazillion times, and I'm gonna counter. And in this alternate footage that was recently released, um, oops, come back. Uh, I'm not gonna play all of it, I'm gonna raise the volume a little. There are some people who are also professional fighting game players who are watching this footage. And just listen a little to what they say. Because Daigo isn't the only one who knew what was gonna happen. He says, yeah, well, there's the cheer. <laughs> you hear him yell, no, <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> so not like, yes, it was surprising. The thing that ended up being super surprising was a technical mastery that came afterwards. But the actual decision making that was happening was not invisible to the people watching, even in that moment. So like, that's, that's kind of what I'm trying to impress upon you here. So as a, as a quick review of that, like, this is what I consider intimate design, intimate game design um, in fighting games and also in, in general. This is a not quite comprehensive list of what we were just talking about. Uh, similar input mechanisms, so players have the same input boundaries. Uh, a palette of expressive options for players to project themselves. Uh, context for understanding what goals player aims to achieve. And uh, that most fundamentally, that last one uh, involving the spectator's camera is that the expressions between players is clear at all times. And this is designing for players to feel that they know each other better than they did before they played. Designing to a allow a certain type of metagame to occur in which players engage with one another, and as a bonus, potentially, for spectators to engage as well. Uh, these are principles and ideas that uh, you are only really indirectly capable of affecting, because your direct means of influencing players as designers is only to touch those systems. You cannot really completely control the metagame. You can only allow that to sort of flourish based on the seeds that you're planting going into it. Uh, that meta engagement is something that is observed and monitored and something that you have to be able to be listening to and then process when you come back because even with the old fighting games that came back came from the 1980s there's no way they would have known 30 years later we'd have something as big as we do today um, and so when you consider stuff like this like I may have spent a long time like breaking down how this functions in the one particular genre history like, I've been particular about my language, I think, in calling it intimate or intimacy games for a reason, because I think there's nothing really sacred about fighting games as a system for doing this. I think they don't deserve this monopoly on intimacy in that system. Uh, like, there are ways to understand other games in this context. Like, I brought up other sports because fighting is not the only space for you to actually understand these games as intimacy games. There are other interactions that play out this way. 
um, before I move on to the next slide, like I will tell you that like I seriously think, and this is a bit of a joke, but like when you and another person are walking towards each other, and that little juke that you do to figure out who's going to go right and who's going to go left is an example of one of those moments. You are trying in that moment to figure out what the other person is going to do. Um, and that's just the small way that it affects you in life. And as a disclaimer, I don't like bringing up the Olympics when talking about competitive games, because too often we get caught up in this discussion about like which game is going to be an Olympic sport. That's really uninteresting to me, because uh, in the grand event where athletes come from around the world to express their energy, their prowess, and their hopes, I think we can ask a much better question, which is that which of these sports from here can be intimate games for us? Uh, to that end, like I have been thinking about just this one specific look, right? Like this talk is just covers fighting games. It's one that I believe is honestly has the most complete arc from when it started into where it is now as an intimate game. Uh, but other genres, especially comp in the competitive space, don't really compare. Like fighting games have come with their own set of baggage, sure. Like the narrative and conversations that arise out of that tension uh, have led to a lot of conflict for its players and some some toxicity that has yet to really be stamped out. I mean, I think that's a commonality that we share in all of our current bodily conflict and war-driven competitive games. Uh, because one of the other problems with the framework of fighting is that the intimacy has really been weaponized for taking down your opponents as a cruel irony. Like, that's something that you have to do. Uh, and so all of the many physical disciplines that are out there, and fictional ones that we've yet to explore as intimacy games, I think dancing games have been one that have historically been more of a choreography space rather than one of expression. Uh, like I like to imagine the fighting game with the punching and kicking replaced with stepping and flowing hand gestures, like combos replaced with partnering to do a sequence of moves that might, might be able to happen. Uh, to my knowledge, there really hasn't been a game like that uh, outside of like improv dancing, like physical improv dancing. Uh, and perhaps the next generation of intimacy games can bring those tools, tools to the front of the players for, uh, for building them as friends and allies rather than as enemies. Uh, that's what I'm hoping to accomplish sometime in the next decade. Uh, and I hope you will too when you like consider radical structures and radical mechanics for what intimate games can be. Thanks. So yeah, I guess that's everything. Uh, do you have any questions?